Welcome to Electron Online. One of the biggest problems in trying to get accurate values for Cepheid variables, their periodicity, their luminosity, and so forth, was the Earth's atmosphere. So all the telescopes that are on the surface of the Earth, looking out into space, the light that reaches them has to come through atmosphere, and there's a lot of turbulence and dust and all kinds of problems with the atmosphere. So, how do you know what the accurate values are. And that's part of the reason why there's so much variation in the Hubble constant. So they thought that if you could put a, a telescope up in space, they would at least eliminate the problems that come with our atmosphere. Even the slight variation in the cloud cover, the slight variation in the moisture in the atmosphere, all these various things can interfere with the accuracy of the values obtained by those telescopes. So getting one up in space is really the key to the hopefully success in coming up with a good value for the Hubble constant. So the Hubble telescope was therefore built, not only for that reason, but that was one of the primary mission objectives, is to be able to take pictures and take the luminosity of Cepheid variables as far away as possible in galaxies as far away as 50 million light years. So how does that work? Well, once you're up in space with the telescope, what you need to do is you need to take pictures of the Cepheid variables in faraway galaxies over a period of days to measure the periodicity and then also to measure the brightness of those Cepheid variables one by one. So, for example, let's say we have a faraway galaxy right here and you probably want to look in one of the spiral arms away from the central bulge where there's too much other light interference and pick off individual Cepheid variables photograph them over time and watch the period of intensity of the light changing or I should say the intensity of light changing and therefore measuring the period. So you do that for all the Cepheid variables. Typically they find anywhere from 20 to 50 or so Cepheid variables in an area that they can photograph. Remember that with Cepheid variables there's a linear relationship between the periodicity, the period of brightness and dimness, versus the absolute brightness, absolute magnitude of the Cepheid variable. The Cepheid variables are very large, very large red giants that are fluctuating, that are now in the what we call the instability strip on the HR diagram, and so the periodicity gives them an indication of how bright they actually are. So what you do is you determine the absolute magnitude by measuring the period. So you get a certain period and on the graph you then from that get the absolute brightness, the absolute magnitude of that Cepheid variable. And of course you do that for every one of the Cepheid variables that you found. Then one by one you take a picture of the Cepheid variables over time and you estimate the apparent magnitude. How bright do they appear? And of course they're changing in magnitude so you want to try to get the average value of that and so you determine that and notice that these are very small values. They're large numbers, positive numbers, but that means they're very, very, very dim. And so very carefully you try to figure out the apparent magnitude. And let's say you do. For a single one, it, let's say that has the absolute magnitude of minus 4, a pair magnitude of 26, you then get the difference in the magnitudes. So 26 minus a minus 4 is a difference of 30 magnitudes. You then take the difference in luminosity between the absolute brightness and the apparent brightness. So the difference in luminosity is the number 2.512 raised to the 30th power, which means raised to the difference in magnitudes, and you end up, you end up with 1 times 10 to the 12th, which is a trillion, meaning that the absolute magnitude is a trillion times brighter than the apparent magnitude. Then to find the distance, you take the square root of that number. So you take the square root of a trillion, you get a million, you take a million, you multiply it times the standard distance of 10 parsecs, and you get 10 megaparsecs, which is 32.6 light years. Which means that based upon those measurements, you estimate the distance to this one Cepheid variable to be 32.6 million light years. And then you do it again for the next one, the next one, the next one, and then you average that out. And whatever the number is that you get for the average of all the Cepheid variables, that will then be the distance to that particular galaxy. And then you measure the radiation coming from the galaxy, the light coming from the galaxy, and you look for the H-alpha line. The H-alpha line is the red light in hydrogen that comes from when an electron jumps from the third level down to the second level. Normally, when the galaxy is moving, that wavelength would be 656.3 nanometers, but because it's moving away from us, 
it'll be redshifted. There'll be a small difference between this number and the number measured that goes in here. You then plug it into your calculator and that gives you the velocity. Now, to calculate the Hubble constant, you take the recessional velocity of the, of the galaxy that was calculated like this, and you divide it by the distance, which is calculated like this. And that, that ratio gives you the Hubble constant. Now, you think it's easy? Oh, it's not easy at all. Take a look at some of the challenges we might have in doing that exercise. First of all, not all Cepheid variables are alike. We have type one, and type 2 Cepheid variables, and sometimes we have kind of a mix in between. And so you're not always sure exactly what type of Cepheid var variable you're looking at, and you're not quite sure exactly for every one of the Cepheid variables that your curve that you're assuming is the correct curve. There's going to be some differences between what's actually happening with Cepheid variables and the curve or the line that you're assuming. Secondly, there's dust in the galaxy that you're looking at, in the spiral arms, and that dust will interfere with the light. For example, there will be some reddening, some dimming of the light, and so you have to take that into account. So your apparent magnitude may be thrown off by the dust that's between the Cepheid variables and our line of sight in that galaxy right there. And then, of course, we're taking pictures from within our own galaxy, and there may be some dust in our Milky Way galaxy between our telescope and where we're looking that also may interfere with our ability to measure the apparent magnitude. So both of those will have some effect in the accuracy of the apparent magnitude. Then there's some additional, and that should be error with an O. There we go. That's why I'm always holding my pen because I make spelling mistakes. So then, of course, you can make errors in spectrometry in measuring the actual wavelength that we're receiving. We have errors in the measurement of the apparent magnitude because we use different filters and we do calculations and we don't always get those numbers quite right. We may not get the periodicity quite right so that we may not be right exactly where we think we are because remember we're looking at galaxies that are tens of millions of light years away and catching the very peak of the brightness and the very bottom of the brightness every time. That is very difficult to do. We don't know exactly where that is, so we don't have the exact periodicity. And of course, the Cepheid variable distance. Notice that these are not all at the same distance. Some are farther out, some are closer in, so we don't know exactly. Of course, with a total distance to the galaxy of 32.6 million light years, you know, 10, 20, 30, 40,000 light years may not make a lot of difference, but again, it adds to the experimental error. So you can see that there's a lot of differences that we need to take into account. To give you an example, we have on four different occasions tried to measure the distance to M100, that beautiful spiral galaxy. Notice the measurements, 56 million light years, 52 and a half, 66 and a half, back to 55. None of them were the same twice. In other words, we always get a different value. So, and some of the values vary quite a bit. So when you can see that there's a lot of variation in the distance measurement, based upon all the things that can go wrong, you can see that it's not an easy task. And so we do our best to come up with an accurate value, but you can see the challenges. At least now you have a good idea why we were able, why um, now you have a good idea how we're able to get the Hubble constant. And again, the, the uh, Hubble telescope that we put in space was the key to be able to measure these Cepheid variables at these incredible distances, even as far out as over 50 million light years. And that was the key to trying to come up with a better value with the Hubble constant, or I should say, with the Hubble telescope. <clears throat> so the Cepheid variables in that galaxy, do they ever mistaken the Cepheid variable to be something else? No, not likely, because Cepheid variables are so unique with the, with the change of the brightness. It's always between 1 and 80 days. If it's less than 1, it's an RR literal variable. It's more than 80 or more than 100, and it's a mirror variable. And yeah, you wouldn't make that kind of mistake. That's not likely. Yeah. But the other things is the difference between population 1 and population 2 stars, meaning type 1 and type 2 Cepheid variables, plus all the other things that could go wrong when you make the measurements, Notice you can have some quite some different results.